I started about 30, over 30 years ago in intelligent buildings. I worked, before I worked, had my own company, I worked as a, a director for a big four company. It was Arthur Young, now you've heard of it as Ernst & Young. I was a practice area director and we worked on a whole new campus in Silicon Valley, California. It was a six building campus and we were looking at bringing in fiber optics and broadband connectivity back then, back in 1985. We talk about what's at the intersection of technology and real estate, huge opportunities if you understand how to apply the technology. We talk about getting an education. The problem with when we talk about real estate today, all the universities and colleges have obsolete curricula. And I can say that because I've talked to them not only in Chicago but in other areas and it's sad, but this is what happens. 20th century solutions are not going to solve 21st century challenges. And that's what we have today. We have education that's so far behind, they don't have one class in intelligent buildings. You can look at any curriculum. Intelligent buildings isn't a new concept. It's over three decades old. We don't talk about intelligent buildings. We don't talk about intelligent infrastructure. We don't talk about intelligent business campuses. How can we have city planners and economic development people to understand what the needs are today if their education is back in the 20th century? And there's nothing out there that's new. And then they wonder why they have lower enrollments. This is what happened. This is what the book talks about. Before we had four spheres of areas, we had real estate, infrastructure, technology, and regional economic development. And now they've all converged. And in order to understand that, you have to understand that new market. That's the market. That's what you have to focus on. You can't focus on, if your degree was a silo degree, focus on one discipline. Whether it's technology, or real estate, or accounting, we need courses and curriculum in this, where everything is converged. Because that's where the market's at. We're not talking about the future, we're talking about right now. In the last 10 years, very different. This is what I've come to see as the, the prime directive in the last decade. Economic development equals broadband connectivity. And broadband connectivity equals jobs. And if there's any politicians out here, Jobs equal votes. Everybody talks a good game about job creation, but then they don't talk about this. You can't have job creation unless you have broadband connectivity coming into the buildings that your corporate facilities are in. Everybody wants to compete. We talk about Amazon. We talk about trying to get a large corporate facility into Chicago. That's a high stakes game. I was on the radio in Milwaukee two months ago on a public policy show, and we talked about Foxconn. Foxconn is the big development that Wisconsin is getting in, and uh, they're going to get a big facility built there. It's over a $10 billion facility. The state had to ante up $3 billion. $3 billion to get this $10 billion facility. And now with Amazon, Amazon's looking for the same type of deal. The big question is, can your city compete? There's a lot of cities trying to get Amazon, because no matter who gets it, it's going to really be a game changer for that region. So I like to tell people. We're going to talk about buzzwords. You know, everybody throws out all these buzzwords. I'm going to give, them, I'm going to give you more than just the buzzword. I'm going to give, give you more or less the definition of them so that you can talk to other people and find out whether they really know what they're talking about or if they're just throwing you out a buzzword. You can't have a smart city if you got dumb buildings. In Chicago, you go to the downtown area, I'd say 96.5% of the buildings are dumb. What do I mean by that? Well, back in the day, we built buildings where we had one connection to the central office, the telephone network, and one connection to Commonwealth Edison at the substation. That was literally the horse and buggy approach 
Back when we still had horse and buggies on, on the roads. The horse and buggy approach, we had the same thing with rule of thumb with architecture. One connection to the central office for telephones, one connection to the Commonwealth Edison. Can't do that anymore. If we're looking at companies that re require mission critical applications, you need to have redundant connections in both the broadband connectivity, two different central offices, diverse networks, and two different substations from Commonwealth Edison. Then you become a smart building. You need those intelligent amenities. As it stands now, most of the buildings are not. Both city and village officials need to understand this. They need to understand that this is critical. And I would say that more small cities and small villages understand this because it's a matter of economic survival. Whereas a lot of people in a lot of large cities think, oh, you're going to come here because we're Chicago. Oh, you're going to come here because we're New York. Not the case anymore. Let's take a look at regional economic development. Regional economic engine is only as good as the weakest layer supporting it. And what do I mean by that? You know, the, the times where any metropolitan area has uh, smooth sailing as far as getting corporate headquarters, that's a thing of the past. And the big question is, where's all the jobs? We're not in the industrial age anymore. We're not going to be looking at a factory opening up and creating 10,000 jobs. We're not going to see U.S. Steel open up and have 20,000 jobs. That's all in a different era. If we can break this down, again, we're going to get beyond the buzzwords. We start with natural resources, and we have, we're pretty blessed here in Chicago. We got the lakefront, got a couple of rivers, got a nice flat land to build on. On top of that is the next very critical layer. That's infrastructure. But I call it the platform for commerce. And you'll see why that's such a more important distinction to call it a platform for commerce. On top of that, we have all our man-made resources. We have our schools, our buildings, our hospitals. And then that creates jobs. Jobs is nothing more than the collection and recirculation of salaries. And if you add all those four up, we get the regional economic climate. That's what it looks like when we look at all these things together. If we're not building on solid infrastructure, if that platform for commerce is not strong, we're going to have a weak economy. We also have to get away from the Sheriff of Nottingham. Remember the story about Robin Hood, Sheriff of Nottingham? Sheriff of Nottingham, if you're going to come through our county, we're going to make you pay a lot of money. We want you to pay a tribute because if you're walking across our county, you got to spend, give us some money because that's what we're going to be building our budget on. We've seen this. High sales taxes. We've seen a beverage tax that just got rescinded. The reason they got rescinded is because so many people started going out outside the county, outside the state, and spending their money elsewhere, and not just on beverages, but on groceries, all groceries. And now they rescinded it, but we still have high sales tax. We have high parking fees if you go downtown. These are not conducive to good economic development. People talk about getting people to go to stores and shop in their neighborhoods. What about downtown? Same thing. Red light cameras. That's not conducive. Here's that Sheriff of Nottingham mentality that I'm going to nick you for $100 because we're the Sheriff of Nottingham. We need the money. Well, what happens if people say, well, I don't feel like driving down there or driving through there anymore because I might get caught with a red light and it's their word against mine and I'm not going to win that. So this is not conducive to good economic development. Neither are seatbelt checks. We have a northwestern suburb on, on uh, a very, uh, not the expressway, but on a major highway up in uh, Schaumburg. They set up a roadblock to the seatbelt check. Oh, you don't have a seatbelt. $75 fine. Now, is it really about public safety? Or is it more about, you know, we got a budget shortfall. Let's see how many people we can nick as they come through our town. Another Sheriff of Nottingham idea of revenue generation. Same with speed traps. When I was elected official 
in East Dundee, which is where Santa's Village is at, we talked about this and we don't want to have speed traps. We don't want to have seatbelt checks because what you're going to do is you're going to alienate people and instead of driving through and maybe stopping at some stores, people are going to find a different route and drive around you. So we have to get the politicians out of this Sheriff of Nottingham approach. And then you have other places where people are stuck in the 1950s. Oh, whatever we put together, we'll just ride on that. Well, it's a whole different century. And there's no creativity. You gotta be creative today. And then they wonder why there's nothing going on. When it comes to corporate site selections committees, if you don't have that platform for commerce and it's not built and all the layers on it are not uh, uh, solid, they're gonna look somewhere else. They're not gonna wait for you to build it. They're gonna go somewhere else, another state, another city. Here's what the platform or commerce looks like. There's the infrastructure. Everything on it is built on a solid platform. <clears throat> the platform for commerce has been around for 5,000 years. Started out with the Egyptians and the Phoenicians building docks and ports so that they expand trade routes and sell more product. Infrastructure has always increased trade routes and commerce. Let's take a look at that. My platform for commerce definition was because I read a, a, a paper that talked about, this was about 10 years ago, it was the American Society of Civil Engineers. Remember how they gave the report card, the grading for all the infrastructure in the United States? B minus for highways, C minus for bridges, D plus for some of the railroads. What they left out, and these are supposed to be professionals, what they left out was network connectivity. The whole network infrastructure they didn't have that layer even talked about. And that's where I came to the conclusion that if we go down the line and ask people, what's your definition of infrastructure? Everybody has a different definition and they don't have a comprehensive view. So I came up with this. I submitted it to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. We presented it at Columbia University in New York. And then later, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers adopted it, and they said it's the business definition for infrastructure and economic growth. And that's my platform for commerce. And if we go through it, there's 5,000 years. We have the Phoenicians and the Egyptians 5,000 years ago building docks and uh, ports. Over a millennium later, we have the Roman Empire. They wanted to go up into Europe they wanted to conquer more land. And they had the greatest army that there was at that time. But before they could start out, they found out, hey, there's no roads. So as a byproduct, the Romans became great road builders and bridge builders. In fact, some of their stuff is still being used today. And then over a millennium later, we have the railroads in the United States. And we're gonna talk about that because that impacts Chicago, and there's a good story to tell on that. And after that, we have the telephone network, 1876, Alexander Graham Bell comes with the telephone. Thomas Edison, Nikolai Tesla come out with a power grid. And all the time we're building more layers and we're increasing the trade routes, we're increasing commerce. And then we come up with airplane in 1903 and the trade routes become via air. And we can go other places by, by air and we can trade and build up more commerce. The trade routes have expanded. Today, we're at broadband connectivity, the internet. Trade routes have become electronic and trade has increased. And if we go one step further, we have interplanetary commerce and we're not gonna see that in our lifetime, but in the next 50 to 150 years, you'll see trade between here and Mars. Colonization of people, to Mars, raw material being sent back to Earth. That's the platform for commerce. It's in the book, and so you don't have to take real good notes because it's all in the book. But that was the clear definition, the framework that we were missing. And we talk about, well, how are we gonna move forward on infrastructure? First of all, we gotta get people on the same page. 
after the Civil War. Did you know that St. Louis was a bigger, more prominent city than Chicago? Chicago was down here. St. Louis was a big city, 40,000 more people, and they were considered the gateway to the West. Railroads wanted to go in there. Railroads were the new layer of infrastructure. They wanted to go to St. Louis because that was the hub that they wanted to build because everything, all the people were going out west to California started out in St. Louis. The riverboat captain said, oh, we don't want the, the railroads to come through here because if you did, they might cut into our business. So they became lobbyists and they said, hey, don't let these guys in. And St. Louis politicians, for being the politicians that they were, listened to the lobbyists. So what happened? In a matter of 25 years, the red line is St. Louis. St. Louis stagnates. Chicago, because it has that extra layer of infrastructure, which is also more trade routes and more commerce, look how it jumped in 25 years. That's why Chicago is more prominent than St. St. Louis should have been Chicago. But the politicians made the wrong decision. Restrict infrastructure. And aren't we at the same place today? The critical planning factor today is we need broadband connectivity. We need fiber optics going all over the place. Because electronic highways are just as critical and important to urban development as what highways and railroads were over 100 years ago. If we talk about Bronzeville, we have to talk about R.R. Donnelly and the big plant they had, because they used to uh, publish all the yellow pages for all the regional bell operating companies. And if you remember, the, the model was let your fingers do the walking. Now we got new technology. It's not let your fingers do the walking anymore. It let, it's let your fingers do the buying. You can actually buy things with your smartphone. Let's take a look at education. We know some people talked about education. Education is key. We started out around 1900, we had in, the, in the, the industrial age, and that's when we started to build public schools. And the public schools were there to assimilate people so that they could walk into factory jobs and industrial age jobs. After World War II, we have the information age. People started using computers. People started using uh, a lot of things within their businesses to automate their businesses. Today, <clears throat> the last five or six years, we're in the mobile internet age. We're beyond the information age. We're in the mobile internet age. We need to get away from the three R's when we teach people and get into fact-based skill sets. And the three R's are not reading, writing, and arithmetic. The three R's that the public schools still, still teach are rote or memorization, repetition, and routine. And that's why there's such a disconnect. People graduate high school and say, I can't find a job. Well, it's because you're ready for an industrial age job, but that job isn't there anymore. And before, six, 60, 70 years ago, if we had a person graduating high school, that was a big accomplishment. And they could walk into a good job to support a family because of those industrial age jobs. We're not there anymore. And yet our education system is stuck on this. What they have to do is teach people from grade school. This thing about repetition and routine. You know, all went to public school, 8.30 the bell rings, you go to class. 9.30 the bell rings, you go to second class. 10.30, you go to class, third class at 10.30, 11.30, you have lunch. 12 years of that indoctrination, you're ready for an industrial age job, but we're not there anymore. We need to teach people flexibility skills, adaptability, because things change on a constant basis. It's not routine anymore. You've got to be creative, because maybe the thing that you're looking at today is a whole new problem. So you have to figure out what are you going to do. And technology skills, of course. I don't think that we have to have people that are good at computer skills and basic computer programs. They have to be trainable beyond high school so they can learn even more. Then you're ready for today's jobs. You see a drone. A drone is a brand new type of technology. But it's a good paying job if you know how to run it. 
Drones weren't even around five years ago. Today, all these different industries use them. They use them for site inspections, roof inspections. Commonwealth Edison looks at it for high tension wiring inspections. Cell towers, instead of sending a guy up 200 feet, 300 feet, they send a drone with a high resolution camera. Then they figure out what the problem is. Then they send a person up. Maybe he only needs two tools. He doesn't have to go up there with 12. Much safer environment, and you get more done because you're using the drone. These are the types of new jobs, new skills that people need to acquire. And that's just one little slice of new technology. <laughs> Another big buzzword is IoT, the Internet of Things. And what I like to tell people, the Internet of Things is only as good as the Internet of Reality. That Internet of Reality is the actual network infrastructure. <laughs> Depending on whose prediction you look at, we had 10 billion wireless devices. And by the year 2020, which isn't that far away, we we're supposed to get up to 30 billion. Or 50 billion, if you believe Cisco. Or 75 billion, if you believe Morgan Stanley's prediction. But all this growth in devices, plus all the traffic that's supposed to come through these devices, we need to put in a lot more capacity in our network infrastructure. And that's when people build that, when they draw that cloud, oh, we're gonna have 50 billion devices and it's all gonna run in this cloud. They don't know anything about what's in the cloud because you need a lot of stuff to support that type of growth. 20th century, 21st century real estate needs, we need a solid platform for commerce. We need to incorporate those intelligent amenities of dual redundant power and dual redundant connectivity in buildings because we need to support a whole new type of technology. We look at smartphone integration, we have entertainment on demand, we have demographics on demand, another big buzzword is big data. Big data, we want to make sure that we understand how people are using their smartphones so that we can target them and sort of customize our focus to them when we're trying to sell them new products and services. And the municipalities have to figure out how do we somehow make some money on this so we get out of that Sheriff of Nottingham mentality. New Edge technology, when we're in the, in, in the information age, we had desktops and laptops. In the mobile internet age, the new Edge technology are smartphones and tablets. Plus BYOD, bring your own device. You go to McCormick Place, you can look at all their applications if you have a smartphone. Go to Soldier Field, you can connect up, get a lot of information on the team and all that, all via smartphone. You're not bringing a laptop in, and they only have a terminal at your seat. But think of all the things you can do now. You can order food, you can order merchandise, and they bring it to your seat. You don't have to sit in the skybox to get all this type of custom service. We need to look at what demands there needs to be on the stadium or any of the other venues. And we also need to look at what do we need from the municipality to upgrade that infrastructure. 21st century economic development today, we got to get away from the Sheriff of Nottingham techniques. And we have to understand this idea, this new idea of capturing the lost customer. And what do I mean by that? Just think of how many people have ever gone to a resort where you go out and everything is paid for and you just shop there. A resort, they want you to stay on the resort perimeter and spend all your money there. They don't want you walking off and going to spend somewhere else. Well, it's the same thing, you can build this electronically. And I talk about this in the book, where we want you to stay on this area, and let's say we're at McCormick Place. We want to make sure that we develop this virtual resort to include all the restaurants and bars and everything else that's around there so that we capture that lost customer. We have 10,000 people going to a trade show. At the end of the day, 10,000 people leave. Just think if you could capture 20 to 30% of those people. Come here for 20% off dinner. Come here for two for one drinks. Come here for a free appetizer. All you have to do is get 20 to 30% to take you up on it. That's 2,000 to 3,000 new people 
coming into your local establishments. I call that the Intelligent Retail Entertainment and Convention Center Complex. And you have to think about that. You have to know how to apply that because that's where we're at today. We need to look at capturing that lost customer. I can do that. You hear about geofencing and beaconing. Those are two different types of technology. But geofencing is basically I set up a perimeter so that as soon as I cross that perimeter, I get something on my smartphone. If some people have like different uh, store apps like Macy's or Carson Perry Scott, uh, you go in, as soon as you cross, you get some type of, hey, 20% discount if you go here. Or 25% in the housewares, go here now, before 12 noon. Need to do that, but on a much grander basis. We need to build that, and we also need to build something where that platform for commerce is built up for everybody. Not just one venue within the neighborhood, or two venues, but everybody in the neighborhood should be on that new type of platform for commerce. This is something that people talked about, some of the people earlier talked about trying to create something and trying to create something that may be an incubator for new businesses. There's something out in Las Vegas that are really interesting called Container Park. It's built out of containers, not built out of a billion dollar casino or anything like that. This was an unused portion of downtown Las Vegas. They said, well, if we could build something where people could bring in their restaurants, bring in their businesses, sort of start up and not be worried that the rent was going to be super high. This has become a very popular place and very successful. And if we build it up, this is something in the book, we build up, here's that enterprise zone, the container park. All those different venues are sitting on top of that. The broadband connectivity covers that whole area. And now we have the ability to send e-coupons together with discounts. And we keep people there. We keep people moving from one place to the other. And our local economy goes up. And this is something where this just is uh, one of the startup places. It's a restaurant, gourmet hot dogs. But all of it's built with containers. It's not a billion dollar development. And this is something to think about as far as thinking about doing something that you don't need a billion dollars to start up a good neighborhood incubator for many different businesses. <clears throat> Here's another view of it. The yellow is the cloud, but then we have the edge technology on the bottom. Everybody's walking in with their smartphones. We have mobile wallet transactions, we have merchandise services, we're collecting all the big data, and we have all these people buying things within that virtual resort area. And if you're gonna buy this equipment, don't buy cheap. You know, there's a lot of counterfeit, and in fact, there's a chapter in the book on procurement of technology. And what you don't want is someone's, oh, we saved a bundle, because there's no fire sale on quality. Believe me, there isn't. And I'll, I'll stop here with my next one. There's no such thing as a new $5,000 Rolls Royce. You want the quality, you want the systems, you want the performance, you're gonna pay. Just like there's no such thing as a Formula One Yugo. For $5,000, you're not gonna go zero to 60 in 2.1 seconds. You get what you pay for. I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see if you don't need the mic, if you do, I'll take it back here. Yes, sir. Of course. A lot of what you said, I agree with, because I've lived it. In my history in technology, it goes back 15 years. So I've watched this slow, circuitous uh, route to get to where we are now. My question on the area of education. Are you seeing any receptivity by the established educational institutions to a new way of training people? Because my experience is the traditional way, the four-year university, which has now become five years, or a, a highly denigrated bachelor's degree, 
when you started in 19 or 2015, by the time you get out of school, you're at least two generations back on the technology. Have you seen the university willing to move away from that? Some, some universities have gone from uh, degree programs to certificate programs. If you read the book, if you read my book, my book is more geared to be, let's say, a three-course uh, three or four-course certificate type of program so that you can compress a lot of things and you're not staying there for four or five years. Plus, the other huge thing is the cost. And when we talk about cost, we're talking about forty dollars to $45,000 a year to go to a four-year school. And if they've got a curriculum that they haven't changed for 30 years, at the end of that time, you've got a curriculum that's already super obsolete, and you're short about another $160,000, $160,000 in tuition. So it has to change. We have to have quicker things, and we have to have things where I've got my degree, I'm not finished. A lot of this is continual education throughout the rest of your life, and a lot of people don't realize that. Follow yes, sir. Follow up question. Okay, I'm going to name names, and I'm going to be diplomatically rude. That's okay. Let's be, let's be politically accurate. I don't need to be politically no, correct. I'm factually and technically accurate, okay. but diplomatically rude. In the city of Chicago, the dominant internet service provider is Comcast. And I have gone round and round with Comcast because they will tell you that the penetration of connectivity mm. in the city of Chicago is 90 plus percent. My point is it's not the penetration of connectivity, but it is the speed of that connectivity. Because what I'm seeing as I move from area to area, if you're in certain areas, there are certain speed levels that are readily available to you. And if you're in other speed areas, they're not. And since we're talking about Inglewood, let me focus on Inglewood. I happen to do technology support for one of those numerous nonprofits in Inglewood. Mm -hmm. Comcast offered us a deal of $65,000 to connect this nonprofit to a backbone that Comcast has roughly a half a mile away. Now this is despite the fact that right across the street from this nonprofit and right across the street from the New Whole Foods, there is fiber optic connectivity, mm -hmm. which by the way, happens to be provided by Comcast. Mm -hmm. that's, that's amazing, but I, I appreciate that, and that has, that's not new. When I did something with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, they were looking at diversity going to two different central offices. And at the time, Illinois Bell told them, oh, non-recurring charge in order to connect up to a central office is like a block and a half away was over a half million dollars. And then uh, this other company, MC Fiber or whatever, came up and said, geez, for all the traffic you're going to put on another diverse route, we'll, do, we'll connect you up for free. All of a sudden, Illinois Bell comes back in. Oh, we uh, sort of recalculated it. We can put this in for free now. You know, competition is good. When you don't have competition, that's when they can say, 65000 hey, that's a bargain. What are you crying about? Uh, we need competition. And we need, you know, when somebody talked about the trillion dollar infrastructure project, I wrote a couple of articles on that. We need to take that trillion dollars and not just spend it on roads and bridges. We can spend it on a lot of the power grid and a lot on the network connectivity. And I talked about going to gigabit per second, billions of, of, of bits per second, not megabits or millions of bits. I talked about going to billions of bits per second to the end user 10 years ago. And people thought I was nuts. And you look at a smartphone today and all the intricate video applications where they eat up so much bandwidth, you need a gigabit today to just go to the end user. And I read this one RFP from the city of Chicago, and we're going to set up this business enterprise zone. And we really want to be competitive, so we want to make it at least 100 megabits per second. I laughed. I said, I said who is, who is writing this RFP? We did something out in DuPage County, and this was about eight years ago. We brought in 40 gigabits of speed from diverse network carriers 
for this technology part. 40 gigabits, not 100 megabits. Today, if you're looking at doing something, we should be looking at 100 megabits in a backbone. That sounds like it's a lot, but is it? It's just like, how many people have garages? It's like the same type of thing where if I had a three-car garage instead of a two-car garage, I could use it up. If you put the bandwidth out there to people, they'll use that up. And you go in and say, oh, well, you don't need a three-car garage. Stick with a two-car garage. And it's like, hey, I'm already, I need a four-car garage maybe. But you, if you open it up, people will find a way to fill up that four garage spaces. And then they'll say, ah, oh, now I need a six-car garage. It's the same with bandwidth and connectivity. And we can't have, I was talking to someone here before, we can't have the, the telephone company or the network provider come in and say, well, we don't know if this, you know, we don't know if you need network, we don't know if you need fiber optics yet. Just use the, the copper cable. We had huge arguments like that with the 911 center. A lot of people don't know this because we don't get covered, you don't get covered by the media and stuff like this. But there were huge arguments at Ameritech. And they said, well, you got copper in the ground. Why do you need a 911 center? Why do you need to have fiber optics? I said, you're gonna obsolete this building before it even opens up in 1995. We had really huge fights. And now, then they take credit. Oh, look, we have fiber optics to the 91 cents of office. But they were adamant about making us use copper. We need, this whole city needs to get more and more fiber as much as possible. Then they can look at Amazon. Amazon, and part of their, their request, Amazon's looking for broadband connectivity. And they specify fiber optics. Well, if you don't have it, they're gone. Yes, sir. Uh, so, so, Jim, then, um, uh, under your model, because uh, you started out and you said, okay, location, location, connectivity. Right. And that, you're saying fundamentally that if the fiber infrastructure is in place, that that's going to equal economic development. Now, it's clear. That's going to help? It's going to help. Now, it's clear from everything that you said that the state is not going to do it, the city's not going to do it. So you're a private developer sitting on a 40-acre site. What should you do to make that site investable according to your model? Are you, okay, sure. are you gonna, are, are, so, and then to what the earlier comment was, if you think the duopoly of Comcast and AT&T are gonna do it, you're also smoking something. So again, if you're a developer sitting on a 40-acre site that happens to be close to Lakeshore Drive or maybe is close to the Chicago River, and you want to make this site attractive so that somebody like whoever might think it's worth something, what should you do from a fiber infrastructure point of view to make that a marketable territory? You need to find a third party, and there are third parties that will bring in fiber. Because you, know, you wait for the phone company to do it, and their attitude is like the old Gallo, Gallo wine commercial. Remember, we will sell no wine before we think it's time. <laughs> well, it's the same with technology. So, so give, me, give me an example of a, of a third party, and give me an example of somewhere on planet Earth where this has been a success story. Okay, well, uh, DePage National Technology Park, which is now called the DePage Business Center, yes. they had a lot of people bringing in fiber, multiple carriers, and one of the things was the uh, uh, Lambda Rail, which is a research network. Yes. They had them bring it in because it wasn't that much further. And then they also had the ability to connect up into the fiber optics that's running along the tollways. And that's what you have to do. And uh, when you're close to a tollway, you can get someone to trench out a fiber optic link and connect up to that fiber optic on that tollway. And you don't have to deal with uh, the telephone company or Comcast. And then you have that con connectivity coming in and you have a totally different um, platform that you can attract corporate uh, class A tenants. Now is this it, before, again, before a client is available to use that dark fiber? Because what I'm looking for is a carrot that's gonna cause the investment to come. And so who's going to, again, be the first guy to write a check to make the capacity available so then other people will say, well, now that you've built this, I wanna come. 
Well, the developer, a lot of times the developer will take a look at that. I'll give a good example on uh, the DePage Business Center, which is an 800 acre campus right by the airport. Uh, the phone company came in and said, now wait to hear this, this is great. We'll come in and we'll put in all the conduit for you. And I told the people that were in charge, I said, you don't want that to happen. He said, why? That's, we're saving money. I said, once you give them the ability that they're putting in the conduit, they control all the access to your park. And so they stepped back and they said, yeah, you know, you're right. And they built it themselves. And I, I worked with another developer in East Dundee at a 120 acre business park. And the same thing, I told them, put in all your conduit now, even if you don't pull fiber, put it all in now, but then when you have someone coming in to put in a data center or a high tech building or whatever, they have the ability to contract two or three different carriers and they're not stuck with one. But if you have the conduit that's being built and all oh, look, you know, you think cheap and say, oh look, we don't have to put in the conduit. The telephone company's building. Well, they're not doing it because they're gracious and they're, you know, they're happy to do it for you. They're doing it so that they can lock up and not have anybody else come and take that network services. Back about eight years ago, there were three cities, uh, St. Charles, Geneva, and Batavia, they had their own electric company. They wanted to run fiber optics to all people's houses. And the phone company and Comcast spent almost a million dollars in negative ads, and the people that were trying to put this fiber in, and they got a referendum to vote on it, they had maybe $5,000. Well, of course, all the negative ads, people voted it down. And then what they should have done is voted it up, because everything, even residential things today, you have a lot of uh, professionals, like downtown and all that, if you have a building that they don't have high-speed connectivity where they can work out of their house, out of their condo, that's not a place I want to live at. I would like for you, if maybe, James, if there's other questions while you're eating, maybe sure. some people can ask you questions sure. directly. But maybe if you could give us, you've been here all morning, you've heard the comments about mm. uh, some concerns that we have in sure. the different communities. If you bring it home to Bronzeville, and you've heard a lot of the pride that this community has, mm -hmm. a lot of the activities, we talk about art, we talk about entrepreneurship, we talk about technology. If you could give us maybe one or two of your own ideas about what you should, what you think that we should go forward with, and we're mm -hmm. going to conclude with that. Sure. Okay. I'll give you two things. Two quick things about Bronzeville. There was a lot of places that were in Bronzeville before that are now out. But that means that there was a lot of power coming into Bronzeville and a lot of network capacity coming into Bronzeville. You want to make sure that if it's there that you can tap into it where they don't say, well, you know, we don't want you to tap into this. Well, if they had so much, we had uh, Michael Reese's the hospital. A lot of power going into that, a lot of network connectivity. How do, we, how do we take that stuff that's already in place and utilize it as much as we can? And if it's not enough, how do we put in more? That's what I'll leave you with. And you can ask me a question, I'll give you a business card. You can call me up later if you have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you.